Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this video, we're going to teach you the absolute basics of writing code in Excel VBA. So we're going to start assuming that you don't know anything at all about VBA. So we're going to be gentle with you. And we're going to begin with the absolute basics of writing code. We'll teach you how you can begin writing a subroutine or a program. We'll give you some good practice guidelines as well for making sure your code is laid out neatly and how you can add comments to your code to explain what's going on. Once we've dealt with the absolute basics, we'll move on and show you a couple of practical things that you can do with writing VBA. So we'll teach you how to write an instruction in VBA to tell Excel to do something. We'll go through the very basic grammar of a VBA sentence, and then we'll show you how you can change the values of cells and how you can format cells as well. After we've done all that, it would be a bit unfair not to show you how to run the code you've written. So I'll have a short section at the end which shows you how you can save a file which contains your code how you can then run a subroutine that you've written, and finally, quite importantly, how you can reopen a file that contains macros and how you deal with basic security settings in Excel VBA. So let's get started. Before we start writing our first program in VBA, we need an example to aim for. So what I'd like our program to do is to create a brand new worksheet in the current workbook, and then to label the top left hand corner of that worksheet with something similar to what we have here who the worksheet was created by, what date it was created on and what version number it is. So to start with we need to get into the Visual Basic Editor and hopefully you've watched our previous video on how you work in and, and modify the Visual Basic Editor. The quickest and easiest way to do it, whichever version of Excel you're in, is to hold down the Alt key and press F11 on your keyboard and that should take you directly to the VB Editor. Now that we're in the VB Editor, we need to create a module which we're going to use to hold the code we'll write. So to do that, hopefully again you remember from the previous video on the Visual Basic Editor, you can either right click in the Project Explorer and choose Insert Module. Alternatively, you can simply head to the Insert menu and choose Module from there as well. Once the module has been created, you can select it, and I always think it's worthwhile renaming modules to explain what's held in them. So once you've selected the module in the Project Explorer, head to the Properties window and type in a new name in place of Module 1. I'm going to call this one VBA Basics. Remember, you can't use spaces in your module names. Hit Enter, and there we go. Now that we have our module, we can start writing our first program. So to do that, click anywhere inside the module you're working in and then begin your program with the word sub. Sub is short for the word subroutine, which is one of the basic units of code in VBA. So a subroutine is, is the same as a macro or a, or a procedure or a program. You'll hear them referred to as all sorts of different words. After the word sub, you need a space, and then you need to think of a sensible name for your program. So mine's going to be called create and label new sheet. Um, it's a nice descriptive name. It's quite long-winded, but it is descriptive. It tells anybody looking at this what this program will do. You'll also notice that I did not use any spaces in the subroutine name, so subroutines cannot contain spaces. Once you've finished typing in the name, all you need to do is press Enter, and you'll see a couple of things happen for you automatically. First of all, the words end sub appear below your cursor, so any, any subroutine that begins has to end at some point. So all of our code is going to be written in between the sub and end sub lines. You might notice as well that the, um, the parentheses, the round brackets appear at the end of the subroutine name. Just accept that those have to be there for the time being. In later videos, we'll show you what these parentheses are for and how you can use them. You might also notice that the, the word sub got a capital letter. I typed it in with a lowercase s, but VBA has capitalized it because it's a recognized keyword. So all we need to do now is start writing the code that will perform our instructions. So I could just start writing my programming instructions exactly where the flashing text cursor is. What I end up with is one very big lump of text that will be quite difficult to read later on. So what I'm going to encourage you to do is after you begin a subroutine, give yourself a blank line and then press the tab key on your keyboard to indent your code one space. 
just to show you the difference that this can make in a slightly longer program, and don't worry if you don't understand what this program does, but I want to show you the difference between writing code with indenting and without. So with indenting, hopefully you can see that the code is much more neatly laid out. We've got blank lines to separate different parts, and indenting indicating the different structures within your code. We have sub and n sub, we have something called a for next loop, we've got an if and an and if structure there as well. And within each of those structures, all of our code is indented. Now compare that to the one below, which hasn't got any indenting at all. It does exactly the same job in exactly the same way, but it's much more difficult to read. So I'm going to encourage you to go with this style of programming, and hopefully you'll agree with me that that's the right thing to do. As well as laying out your code neatly, another thing that will help you, or even your users, to understand what your code is doing is adding comments to your code. So you can begin a comment in one of two ways. You can either write a single quote or an apostrophe and then type in your, your comment. Or if you're feeling a bit more old school, you can type in the word rem, which is short for remark. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to type in three characters when you can type in just one. So I'm going to stick to using apostrophes for my comments. Once you've begun a comment, you can write out pretty much whatever you want after this, anything that describes what your program or the next line of code will do. So the first line of code we're going to write is going to create a new worksheet. So my comment is going to say, uh, create a new worksheet. It's hopefully going to be fairly obvious anyway. It's a little bit of an unnecessary comment. I wouldn't recommend adding a comment to every single line of code you write. I think that's a bit of overkill. But um, every sort of maybe four or five lines or so, or when an important new technique that you're using crops up, comments are really handy for that. Once you finish writing the comment anyway, you don't need to close the quotes. You can simply press enter at the end of the line. And hopefully you'll see that the comment will turn a different color. By default, the color is green. And if you remember from our previous video on setting up the Visual Basic Editor, you can always head to the Tools menu, choose Options, and in the Editor Format tab, you can modify the colors of any type of text. So you can select the comment text and choose a different color if, if green isn't particularly visible to you. But I'm going to cancel out of that for now and stick with my green color. OK, so now we need to write the instruction that will create a new worksheet. So to do that, you need to know a little bit about the basic sentence structure in VBA. I'm going to write a quick comment here, which I'll delete in a moment. Basic VBA sentences. In layman's terms, the way a basic VBA sentence or instruction works is you begin a sentence with a reference to a thing. So that would be the thing you want to perform an action on. Then you follow that with a full stop, and then you say what action you would like to perform. So that's the, the way sentences always are built in VBA. It's always the thing first, followed by a full stop, and then what you want to do to that thing. In VBA terms, the thing is referred to as an object, and the action is referred to as a method. Sorry, not method, method. So, our basic sentence to create a new worksheet is going to look like this. The object we want to refer to is something called worksheets. Worksheets refer to a collection of all the worksheets in the workbook. If I type in a full stop, I'm actually going to see a list of all of the things that I can do to that particular object. So, the list that appears is referred to as IntelliSense which is a horrible name for the feature, but it's actually really, really useful. You can scroll through this list using the cursor keys or using the mouse and the scroll bar. You can even begin typing in the, the, the words if you know the ones that you want to use. So I could start typing in, for instance, the letter M, and that would take me to the first item that begins with the letter M. But that's not what I want to do here. The thing that I want to do to my worksheets object is actually the very first item in this list. It's the method called add. I can tell that this is a method because it has a little green flying brick symbol next to it. I've no idea what these are meant to represent. They always look like little green flying bricks to me. But any time you see one of these little green flying brick symbols, you can tell that you're looking at a method in VBA terms. So with the word add highlighted, I can either double click on it with the mouse or even more simply, I can press the tab key on the keyboard to type in the rest of the word. At that point, if I press enter, that's my first VBA instruction written. 
Now the next thing that I'd like to do in my code is start adding some values to my cells. So I want to start labeling the cells. So I'm going to add a blank line and I'm going to add another comment. Um, add titles to cells. Now the way that we're going to do that is in a slightly different sentence structure than the one we used previously. We're not going to use a method of our cells. We're still going to start by referring to an object. So just a quick comment to describe how this will work. We're going to refer to an object first and then rather than try to perform an action, we're going to change something called a property. So a property is like an attribute of an object. It's something you can look at and investigate, and in many cases it's something you can also change. So to change a property, you assign a value to it using an equals operator. So object.property equals whatever value you want to assign. So for us, the objects in this case aren't going to be worksheets. The object we're going to refer to is a specific cell. And in VBA, there are several ways to refer to cells in Excel. The method we're going to use today is using the range keyword. So start with the word range, open some parentheses or round brackets, and then some double quotes, and then type in the cell reference of the cell you want to refer to. Close the double quotes and close the round brackets and that's the reference to the object. Now we need to specify which property we want to modify and the way that we can do that is in the same way as with the worksheets dot add line we type in a full stop and that will display the IntelliSense list showing me all of the methods again you can see the little green flying bricks are the methods and the properties which are represented by these little fingers pointing at bits of paper I suppose or choice of symbols anyway the property that we want to refer to to modify the information stored in a cell is called value so if I start typing in the word value I start by V and then A that takes me to the word validation value is one row down from there so if I press the down arrow key on my keyboard I can then press the tab key to type in the rest of that word what I can do then is type in an equal sign the spaces aren't actually important to type in here I could get away without typing in the spaces by the way those will be added in for me actually automatically and then after you've typed in the equal sign you have to say what value you want to assign so for me this is going to be a piece of uh, literal text or a string and all strings in VBA are enclosed in a set of double quotes so in a set of double quotes I want to type in the words created by and then close the double quotes and at that point I can hit enter and that's my first label added to my cell now the next couple of lines are going to be very similar to what I've written here to modify the value of cell A1. I want to add titles to cell A2 and A3 as well. There's no real point in typing out this full line of code time after time when all I really need to modify are the cell references and the text that I'm assigning. So there is no such thing as cheating when it comes to writing VBA code. Trust me on that one. Copy and paste. If it speeds up what you're doing, please do copy and paste lines of code. You can do this using the right click menu as I've just done there. You can also do it using the keyboard shortcuts, Control C to copy, Control V to paste. And then all you need to do is tweak the little bits that you need to modify to update the instruction. So I can do that one more time and then change cell A3 and the value of cell A3 should be version. That was the title I wanted to add. So that's a nice and quick and easy way to assign values to multiple cells, copying and pasting lines of code. So now that we've filled in the titles for our cells, I want to start filling in the user's details. If I quickly switch back to Excel for a moment by holding down Alt and then pressing F11 on the keyboard, you can see the sorts of things I'd like to fill in. So the username essentially of the person who created the worksheet and the date it was created on and then whichever version number they wanted to assign. So for the username, rather than always typing in the same name, I'd like that to read the person who's using the macro at the time, who's running the program. So whoever's logged into Windows, I want that username to appear in cell B1. Likewise for the date, I don't want to have to type in a, an exact date. I want 
Excel to read whatever today's date is and use that value instead. The version number will, will set to a value of one always. So, uh, so that one will be uh, sort of absolutely filled in. So if I press Alt and F11 to switch back to the VB editor again, what I can now do is start filling in those values with some more lines of code. So I think it's worth a quick extra comment here that says add user values to cells. And I'm also going to do a quick bit of tidying up as well because I, I, I think this bit up here is a little bit messy. So let me get rid of those few lines there and that makes things a little bit neater. And then at that point I can simply paste in the line that I copied earlier on that modified the value of cell A1. And I can change that now to cell or range B1.value equals. And then instead of using an explicit piece of text, a literal string. What I'm going to do instead is use a function that will calculate the username of the person logged into Windows. So if I type in the function name, which is called environ, it's short for environment, and it actually lets you pick up on a variety of Windows environment variables. To specify the particular bit of information you want, open a set of round brackets, and then for this particular function, a set of double quotes, and then the value of the parameter you want to retrieve. So I want to retrieve the user name. Close the double quotes, close the round brackets, and that is another way to set the value of a cell. So rather than setting it to be an explicit value, this is going to be calculated by evaluating this function. We can do a similar thing to calculate the date that will go into cell B2. So again, if I paste in the same line that I copied earlier and modify the cell reference, this time to B2, and instead of this literal string, I'm going to replace that with a call to the function that calculates the date. And it's really easy to remember in VBA, the function is simply called date. If I hit enter, there's one more value to fill in. I'll paste in the line one more time, change the cell reference to B3. And this is going to fill in the, ver the version number of the worksheet. So we're always going to set that to 1 by the first time we create each sheet. So if I remove this literal string, I can simply type in the number 1. In VBA, numbers don't need to be enclosed in any kind of characters like text enclosed in double quotes. Numbers can, be, can just be typed in as they are. The final thing that we're going to get our subroutines to do is to format the titles that we added to cells A1, 2 and 3. So let's have a new blank line and another new comment. This is going to say format titles. Now the lines of code that I'm going to write here are going to, going to be slightly different to what we were doing before. We're not going to modify the value property. There are other properties of cells that we need to modify to format them. So rather than paste in the line, I'm going to type this one out from scratch. So I need to start with the word range again. I need to refer to a range of cells. Rather than type out the whole word, it's worthwhile knowing that you can force the IntelliSense list to appear by holding down the control key and pressing the space bar. If you do that at the beginning of a line, it will populate a list consisting of all the main keywords you can refer to in this context. The word I want to use is a word called range. So if I look for the word range, I can type in the letter R. It happens to be the second one below or the second item that begins with the letter R, so I use the arrow keys to select the word range and then press the tab key to type it in. Again, I need to open a set of round brackets and then double quotes. And this time, rather than refer to individual cell references, such as A1, A2, A3, etc., what I'm going to do is refer to the entire block with A1, colon, a3. So it's very similar to the style of cell reference you see when you're using the sum function, for instance, in Excel. And it's not the only way to refer to a block of cells. There are many, many more ways to do this, but this one will suffice for now. So we close the double quotes after A3, close the round brackets, and then I can type in a full stop and see the list of properties I've got to act on to format these cells. So the first thing we'll try to do is modify the font color of the cells we've referred to. So to do that, I need to first of all refer to the font property of the cells. And you can see it's a property because it has this little finger pointing at a piece of paper symbol. But font itself has a bunch of other sub properties as well. So after the word font, if I type in another full stop, that gives me another IntelliSense list with a subset of properties which apply to this font property. So we're like, it's, this, this is like an extension of the line we wrote up here, object.property equals value. We're going to have object.property.property .property equals value.
So the property we want in this case is called colour. Now watch out UK users, it's the American spelling of colour. There's no U in the word colour in VBA. Regardless of which language settings you're using on your computer as well, by the way, this is always, always the American spelling. But we can make colour equal to something. So dot font dot colour equals and there's a really quick simple example. I'm going to make the font colour blue and the easiest way to do that in VBA is to type in VB blue. Hit enter at the end of the line and there we go. Now the next thing I'd like to do is modify the background colour of the cell and it's another similar principle. I need to start by referring to the range of cells I want to, to modify. So I'm going to press control in the spacebar to pop up with the IntelliSense list. Look for the word range first of all by typing in the letter R press the down arrow key, and then I can press tab to type in the rest of the word. Then I can open my, my round brackets and double quotes and refer to A1 to A3. And yes, I know I probably should have just copied and pasted this part, but I wanted to show you going through that process again. And then this time, when I type in a full stop, the first property that I'm looking for is called interior. If I type in the three letters INT, that shows me the word interior. And just like with the font property of a cell, the interior property has more sub properties. So if I press tab to type in that word and then press the full stop key, that gives me another list of properties. And the one I want, hopefully again, you can see is the same as before, it's color. So I'm going to make color equal to something else. Now, previously we used something really simple. We used VB blue in our previous example. There's eight of these visual basic colors. There's VB blue, VB red, VB green, VB yellow, VB white, VB black, and then the two slightly odd ones, VB cyan and VB magenta. Now we know that there are many more than just eight colors available in VBA. In fact, you've got a full range of 16.7 million colors that you can use. To pick from a slightly uh, smaller subset of 16.7 million, there's a set of what, what are referred to as the RGB colors. So if I press control and space on my keyboard at this point, to display the IntelliSense list. And if I type in the three letters RGB, that will take me to the list of RGB colors. So it's a much wider selection that you can choose from here um, with some lovely flowery fancy names. So I, I haven't the faintest idea what half of these actually are. So you could choose one at random and, and sort of try to, to try to see what it looks like when you've run your code. And if you don't like it, you could go back and, and modify it later. Maybe we'll go with RGB light cyan for the time being. Let's see, let's see what that gives us. So if I press tab with that word highlighted, I can finally press enter. And I think at this stage, I'm happy with what my program is trying to do. So the next step is to save it and then run it. Now, I always think it's worthwhile saving any code you've written before you attempt to run it. And the main reason for that is that you can't undo what a macro does. So once you've run your code, you cannot undo its changes other than by closing down your workbook and reopening it to get it back to a previous version. So save it first. And you can do this in, in a couple of different ways. Any code you've written, you can save either by clicking the save button here in the Visual Basic Editor, but you could also just switch back to Excel. This time I'll click the Excel button here or press Alt and F11 on the keyboard. And you can also save your, your work from within Excel itself. So if I clicked the save button here, that would also save any code that I've written. Now the very first time you do this in a blank workbook, if you choose to save a file, and I'm going to try to put this, I'll simply plunk it onto my, uh, maybe into my, my C drive perhaps, and I'll call it something along the lines of, let's see, uh, basic VBA. That's about basic, theory me. Basic VBA. Now, if I try to save this as a normal Excel workbook, when I hit the save button, I'm going to get a warning message saying that I'm not allowed to save a Visual Basic project in a macro free workbook. So what I need to do at this stage is click the no button. I do not want to continue saving without my macros. So I choose no. What I need to do instead is change the type of workbook from a standard Excel workbook with Excel SX to an Excel macro enabled workbook, which is the standard choice. You could also, if you wanted to, choose the binary workbook. This allows macros to be saved, but also the uh, the old legacy version of Excel, 97 to 2003. 
Notice that if you're already using Excel 2003, you won't have to make this choice. This is only for Excel 2007 and later. So what I'm going to do is choose the macro enabled workbook type. It's basic VBA is the name of the workbook. And if I choose save, my macros are now safely saved. Okay, so nearly time for the moment of truth. We need to run our macro to check that it actually works. Before I do that, I'm actually going to delete my, my little test sheet here, the one that I set up to demonstrate my example. So I'm going to right click sheet one and choose to delete it. There we go. And now when I run my macro, I'll know for sure that it has achieved the results that I wanted it to, because all the other sheets are blank. So what I can do is go back to the Visual Basic Editor. I'm going to press Alt and F11 to do that. Then I need to make sure I've selected any line. I need to make sure my cursor is anywhere between sub and n sub for the program that I'd like to run. Then I've got several choices. I could head to the Run menu and click on the option that says Run Sub. I could also press the F5 key on my keyboard. Or I could also just click the little green triangle button on my toolbar. Again, I get a little hint about pressing F5. I'm going to press the F5 key on my keyboard and after a, hopefully a brief flash of the egg timer mouse cursor, you might notice already that something has definitely happened because my Project Explorer is showing me that I now have a new Sheet 4. So if I switch back into Excel, there we go. There are my cells filled in on a brand new worksheet. I'm not quite sure about my light cyan color choice, by the way. I might go away and change that. But I should see that all the values have been filled in. I've got my username in cell B1. I have today's date in cell B2. And there we go, success. I think just because I'm not happy with my color choice, I'm going to delete that worksheet. And I'm going to go back to my code by pressing Alt and F11. And I'm going to modify the color that I've chosen here. So I'm going to select this color and delete it. I'm going to press Control and Space on my keyboard type in RGB, which I know will get me back to the list of red, green, blue colors. And I'm going to look for another color, maybe something, maybe there's a color that starts with the word pale, perhaps. So there's all the light colors. Pale, pale turquoise, perhaps. Let's go with that one. I'll go with pale turquoise. So I've made a change to my code. I'm going to save it before I run it. Always a good policy. Then I'm going to click the little green triangle, making sure that I've clicked anywhere inside this subroutine. I'm going to click the green triangle and I now have a new sheet five. If I switch back into Excel, that's a much better choice, pale turquoise. So there we go. Success with running our macro. So we've seen how to run your macros from within the Visual Basic Editor, but you can also choose to run your code from within the Excel environment. And there's many ways that you can do this. In a later video, we're going to show you some nice fancy techniques where you can create buttons on the spreadsheet or attach macros to, to images and clip art, and even create your own ribbon tabs and toolbar buttons to run your macros. Today we're just going to focus on the absolute basic way of doing things. So if you're in Excel 2007 or later, you can head to the Developer tab on the ribbon, and find the Macros button here and click on it, or you can use the keyboard shortcut which appears, which is Alt and F8. When you select this option, it displays a dialog box which lists out all of the macros that you've written or recorded in all of the open workbooks. You can limit this list to just a specific workbook if you prefer. All you need to do then is select the, work, uh, sorry, select the macro that you want to run and simply click the Run button. And that should do exactly the same actions as we saw earlier on. One other thing that you quickly need to know is how to do the same thing in Excel 2003 because the, obviously the developer tab is not available in the ribbon. So in earlier versions of Excel, what you would do instead is head to the Tools menu, choose Macro, and then choose Macros. And again, you could use the same keyboard shortcut, but that will display the same list and you can select the macro and click Run to run it. The final thing we're going to cover in this video is how you go about reopening a file which contains VBA code. And that might sound like it should be an easy thing to do, but you have to be aware of the default settings in Excel, which try to disable macros when you open files which contain them. And it sounds quite annoying that that happens, but it's, a, it's, a, it's done for sensible reasons. The, the, it's a security feature. If you were opening up a file which contained code that you yourself hadn't written, how could you guarantee that it was safe? So, although it's a little bit annoying, it's a good idea in general. 
Now the way that you choose to enable macros when you open up a file is slightly different depending on which version of Excel you happen to be using and also whether or not you have the Visual Basic Editor open at the time as well. So let's start with Excel 2010 and the same technique works in Excel 2013 as well. So I'm going to close down my file which contains macros and at this point I don't have the VB Editor open. When I choose to go to the file menu and choose to reopen that file what I'll see at the top of the, the screen to begin with is a little uh, warning message in the, uh, in the message bar and it tells me that my macros have been disabled. Very, very simple in this version of Excel, 2010 and 2013. All you have to do is choose to enable content and now your macros will work again. Okay, so let, now let's do the same thing but with the Visual Basic Editor open. So I'm going to press Alt and F11 to reopen the VB Editor. Now I'm going to switch back into Excel, close down my file and I'm going to reopen it again. So I choose File and then choose the, the same file to open. This time with the VB Editor open, I don't, I don't get the message bar at the top of the screen. I get a much more obvious message that I need to choose to enable my macros. So very simple in this case, just hit the Enable Macros button and once again, you'll be allowed to run your code. So that's how it works in Excel 2010 and 2013. Let's have a look at Excel 2007 at this point. So I'm going to close down my file in Excel 2010 and head over to Excel 2007. And again, if I choose to open the file without the Visual Basic Editor open, when I open my file, I get another security warning in the message bar at the top of the screen. This time though, it's not as simple a choice as just clicking Enable Content. I have to click Options, which displays another dialog box, then choose to enable this content and then click OK. So it's a slightly more streamlined process in Excel 2010. The same thing would happen as Excel 2010 if I had the VB Editor open. So if I open up the VB Editor, head back into Excel, close down the file, choose to reopen it, and again I get the dialog box which appears in which I simply click Enable Macros. Now the process for opening files with macros in Excel 2003 or earlier is somewhat different. So if I switch into that application, I'm going to head to the file menu and I'm going to choose to open up uh, a different version of the same file. So it's a, it's a, it's a legacy version of, of the basic VBA file we've been working on. When I choose to do that, I'll be presented with a slightly more complex dialog box with a much longer message. But the important part here is it's saying that macros are disabled because the security level is set to high. So actually Excel 2003 and earlier had a higher level of security than the newer versions of Excel do. If I want my macros to run, what I have to do is change the macro security level, then close and reopen this file. So to do that, I first of all need to click OK on the message which has appeared, and then I need to head to the security settings dialog box, and I can do that in a couple of different ways. If I have the Visual Basic toolbar display, there's a quick way to get to security settings from the, the, the button called security. Alternatively, I can head to the tools menu, choose macro, and then choose security from this list as well. So you can see there that when I display the dialog box, that the default setting of security in Excel 2003 is high. The sensible choice, the one that kind of replicates what we're doing in Excel 2007 and 2010, is the choice called Medium. This is one that will always ask you every time you open up a file, would you like to enable macros? So if I choose OK, and then close down the file that I'm working on, I don't need to save any changes because I haven't changed the file itself. I've changed a setting in Excel, the application, rather than in a specific workbook. But if I go back to the file menu now, choose to reopen that file, this time I'll be asked would I like to enable or disable macros. And this is true in Excel 2003, this is true whether you have the VB editor open or not. You will always see the message presented to you in this way. So if I choose enable macros, I can now reuse my code. As I've just mentioned how to change the security settings in Excel 2003, I'm going to very quickly show you how you can do the same thing in later versions of Excel as well. So if I head into, let's say, Excel 2010, to do this I can, I can choose one of two options. I can either go to the Developer tab in the ribbon and choose the Macro Security option there, and the same is true for Excel 2007. Alternatively, I can head to the File menu and choose Options, or in Excel 2007 I would choose the Office button and then choose Excel Options. On the dialog box which appears, I need to head to the Trust Center very Orwellian sounding place, but in the Trust Center, you can then head to Trust Center Settings. Finally in there, 
you can head to the macro settings tab and this gives you the four levels of macro security. They're described completely differently in these versions of Excel. So they're no longer low, medium, high, etc. They have much more descriptive uh, settings. So, so the default setting for, for newer versions of Excel is to say disable all macros with notification, which means that when you open up the file, macros are disabled, but it tells you that they are disabled and you get the choice to enable them. The other levels you can switch between at will. I think, again, this is the most sensible one to go for, the disable all macros with notification. So if you find that somebody had changed your settings in your particular version of Excel, this is how you can get back to and change them to back to their default. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wiseowl.co.uk.